the We Knew the Moon podcast is now the official podcast of the Goddess Temple Twickenham. Find out more on their website, www.goddesstempletwickenham.org, or find the Goddess Temple Twickenham on Facebook and Instagram. You're listening to We Knew the Moon with Dee Safier, an empath who started a podcast to explore the universe, spirituality, and all things witchy woo-woo. Don't forget to check out the website, weknewthemoon.co.uk, for all your I do what I want and the moon made me do it merch, whichever excuse you prefer to use for all of your life choices. Hi, my name is Dee and this is We Knew the Moon. I'm joined today by Michelle Alderson from the Heartfelt Illustrations again. Hello, Michelle. Hi, Dee. So you are a returning guest because you joined us a few episodes back and covered the Pendle Witch Trials. Yes. And it inspired us to do the topic that we're going to do today, because today we are covering the Salem Witch Trials. Yay. I know. Can't wait. So spoiler, it doesn't end well. It's a topic that we discovered was quite close to both of our hearts, isn't it? Because, Michelle, mm. you told me that you got engaged in Boston, which is... I did. Happy yes. Outside. I used to live in Boston. For those of you who think I'm American, I'm not. I had a bit of time living in Boston and learned English there, which is why I sound like this. So we just thought it'd be a really great topic to follow on from that Pendle Hill Witch Trials episode. I've actually got a funny story. I can't remember if I told you, Michelle, but act like I've never told you this before. Okay, (laughs) go on. So we lived in Boston when I was between the ages of two and four. And I remember, it must have been later on in our stay when I was closer to four, but I remember being taken to Salem right. to visit it. But the reason why I remember it, it's because I was traumatized and my mom thought that I was crying and upset because um, maybe I was too young to go to like the Salem Museum and stuff like yeah. that. And, you know, the stories of witches were scaring me. That didn't bother me at all. I loved that. The reason why I was like really upset and crying is because when we were in the queue for the museum, I had a lollipop and the woman in front of me had a white coat and I accidentally (laughs) pinked down the back of her coat. Did she see? I don't think she saw, but basically the Catholic guilt got me (laughs) and I just felt so bad and I was just crying about it. So I only confessed recently, like age 33. That that's why I was so upset. So, lady, if you're listening to me, if you're listening to this episode, <laughs> and you came home from the Salem Museum, it's not unheard of. It's not crazy, is it, that someone who went to the Salem Museum might listen to this podcast? Um, but if you came home and you had like sticky pink stuff on the back of your jacket, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. It was you. <laughs> it was me. I still feel guilty about it. It's literally 35 oh. years on. Oh, <laughs> you should. You guilty. should. <laughs> so um so just a quick recap about the Pendle witch trials in the UK because they were kind of a precursor weren't they yes they were, um, yeah. and I'll go into a little bit the history of England and New England in the states and how they're tied mm. and so forth because again that plays a role yeah. the Pendle witch trials they were in 1612 12 people were accused please correct me if I got any of this wrong one died in prison of the 11 who went to trial nine of which were women, two of which were men. Ten were found guilty and executed by hanging. One was found not guilty. That's right, yeah. I made a mistake in that episode because I think I said the Salem witch trials were like 100 years later. They weren't actually that. They were like 80 years later. Right, so it's not as long a gap as... Yeah, I think I said like 100 or 200. It it wasn't that long. Um, Mm. The Salem witch trials were 1692 to 93 it was 80 years from on from the Pendle Witch Trials which relatively speaking was a lot longer than it is now because people lived a shorter amount of time yes but you know it was like there will be very few people who are alive during the Pendle Witch Trials that will be also alive during the Salem Witch Trials is what I'm saying so yeah they started in 92 in February 92 and ended or drew to a close in May um, 1693. This was on a much larger scale than the Pendle Witch Trials, as you know how America does everything bigger. (laughs) More than 200 people were accused. Wow. Pendle Witch Trials, it was 12 people accused. Pendle is a tiny village, but Salem would have been a much bigger area with more people living there. I think it might have been more densely populated. And I'm going to go into sort of the background and the 
the religious and the social and the uh, political context. Yeah. You know, you'll see mm. how, um, but I think that Pendle, we'll discuss this after, I think the Pendle witch trials, because they would have known about it, because obviously it's a lot of people from the UK going over to New England, and mm. that's where Salem is, and that's why it was called New England. So they will they will have known about the Pendle witch trials. Yeah. And it will for sure have influenced their actions and so forth. So they're definitely tied in that respect. More than 200 people were accused as opposed to 12 in Pendle, so much larger scale. In total, 30 were found guilty. 19 of them were hanged. 14 of these were women and five were men. So again, men could be accused of witchcraft, but it was by far a higher percentage of women that were at risk yes. of being accused of witchcraft. A lot of the men, it seems, were the husbands of the witches in quotation marks. Right. So if you were seen to defend a witch, which you would hope a husband would do of his wife, yeah. then you were then in the crossfire. Another man was pressed to death when he didn't plead and five people died in prison. Yeah. Because again, like Pendle, prison was no joke back then. No. Nowadays, we see it as a case of mass hysteria that was influenced heavily by gender, religion, race, isolation, mm. you know, very difficult. Being the sort of early immigrants to the area was, again, no joke. It was hard. So luckily, where the Pendle witch trials kind of marked the beginning of the end of witch trials in the UK, sadly, Salem marked the beginning of this yes. witch hysteria in yeah. the States. And it started with a really interesting sort of turn of belief. In 1668, in a book called Against Modern Sadducism, Joseph Glanville claimed that he could prove the existence of witches and ghosts in the supernatural realm. And he wrote that men should believe in witches and that it's part of Christianity. So before, you wouldn't oh. really have Christians believing in superstitious things and the supernatural and witches oh. and spirits and so forth. You wouldn't have them believing that. It was seen as not very Christian. Right. But this guy was starting to argue that you should believe in it. It's part of Christianity because if you don't believe in these supernatural evil beings, how can you believe in angels? Like they're opposites. You have to, yeah, like the devil and God. Yes. So they're the positive and negative of the same yeah. type of thing. So he's arguing that if you don't believe in witches, you're a heretic, basically, and you're not right. Christian. Whereas wow. before people just wouldn't really believe in witches. They would for sure believe in the woman who was very good with the herbs, the woman, the wise woman you would go to if you had an illness or if you were pregnant or whatever, but they wouldn't, they didn't believe in witches, evil spirits and so forth. And they wouldn't have been associated in that way, would they initially? No. That's, that's the thing. That just would have been that woman's yeah. profession. Exactly. And nothing supernatural about it. She just knows a lot about plants or right. about illness. In fact, in a weird way, it's, it's more earthly. She's literally a plant yeah. expert, you know. Exactly. Think of it like that. That's not that supernatural. That's knowing no. about our own environment. Now people are starting to believe in witches because yes. they're basically told they have to or they're not Christian. It's a time of a lot of religious prosecution. So you had to fall in line. Otherwise, you were mm. at risk. And we have, I, I have to laugh at these names, right? This is the first time that this guy pops up in our story. Cotton Mather, <laughs> I think I'm saying it right, um, Mather, Mather, Cotton Mather was another writer at this time, and he was trying to prove that evil spirits, demons, witches, etc., that they all exist, and if you don't believe them, you're a heretic, mm. and this started to influence, this was all in New England, um, right. started influencing people's opinions there of witchcraft. And you actually have the first recorded witchcraft execution in the States of a lady called Alsa Young in 1647. So that's almost like 50 years before the Salem witch trials. Right. In Hartford, Connecticut. This is known as the Connecticut witch trials or sometimes the Hartford witch trials, obviously far less known. Yes. No, I didn't know anything about that. But Connecticut... And Hartford, Hartford is only 134 miles from Salem. So it's not that far away. So no. it's the same communities, really. Yeah. It's still in New England. 
I went on Google Maps and obviously they don't have like a horse and cart option, but it would take you 40 hours to walk it or 13 hours by bike, which I kind of assume is the closest to a horse. Yeah. But really not that far. It's a couple of days journey away. I'm sure there's yeah. links between Hartford and Salem at this point in time. So they probably knew those communities and moved between them occasionally. For sure. And they would have known about someone being executed for being a witch. That yeah. gossip would have traveled, is my point. Absolutely. So because the Connecticut witch trials actually went on, so the Salem witch trials went on for two years. The Connecticut witch trials went on from 1647 to 1663. So, you oh. know, it's like, what, 15 years? But it's about 30 years before the Salem witch trials started. But again, for sure, would have been another precursor to those so trials. So in that area, they're, they're already really aware of witches yeah. and finding witches and taking them yeah. to trial. And the population will know that you are an, in danger if you are accused of being a witch. And, yes. you know, probably would do a lot to avoid that because it was a ruthless, ruthless society. So in the Connecticut witch trials, 37 people were accused and 11 were executed. Right. So the whole of New England was the land of the pilgrims from England, hence the name New England. Right. And they went there for religious freedom. And in my view, they are religious extremists because to undertake such a risky journey and to set up in an unknown land yes. when, you know, they could have re escaped religious persecution by going to some places in Europe like Holland. But the ones that are willing to go this far, I mean, that in my mind is quite extreme, right? Was the idea to begin like a brand new society from scratch that yeah. was just of their religious thought? Yes. Yeah, so so the yeah. idea was to start a new land with religious freedom. But in reality, it was to set up a community of people that believe exactly what they believe. Yes. And these were isolated rural communities yeah. in the States in the 1600s. So <laughs> to do that, like I said, pretty extreme. They could have gone to Europe, which was not that risky a journey. It was much more you know, much safer option, much yeah. closer. So these are people that were committed to their ideas. So I had to get into a little bit, I just said Puritans, I had to get into a little bit of the background, <laughs> you know, the religious wars mm. in, in the UK and what the different words meant and so forth, which was not something I was super familiar with. So I'm going to just go through that now because it's the reason for the Salem witch trials. So just as in England, where the monarchs flipped between being Protestant and Catholic, sometimes they themselves converted, sometimes one monarch was Protestant and the next one was Catholic. The same was true of the leadership in New England. It's very much right. in the UK. So, you know, there's a lot of flipping and changing your religious convictions mm. to spare your life, really. So we're actually talking about, when we talk about the Salem with trials, we're talking about Salem Village, which is present day Danvers, and Salem Town, which is present right. day Salem and they had a bit of a rivalry you will see the um, similarities between the Pendle witch trials um, they had rivalry between these two the Salem village and the Salem town they had rivalries over property lines grazing rights of their animals church privileges whatever the fuck. church privileges <laughs> I know <laughs> just reminded me of the the rivalry between you remember the shit house and the other house oh yes oh gosh but I think the difference was in the Pendle witch trials there was rivalry between two families that were viewed as cunning folk or witches yes. here the rivalry was between the two main families and right. you know they were very high up in society whereas I gather that wasn't necessarily the case of the rivalries that no. led to the downfall of the Pendle witches in quotation. so these were socially high in yeah, their community. prominent so one... families up until 1680s New England was run by very conservative Puritan leaders. So what a Puritan was, I never knew the full definition. So a Puritan was an English Protestant of the 16th and 17th century who sought to purify the Church of England of Roman Catholic practices. Right. And it's mm. like, why do you care? Just do what exactly. you want. But, so they were Church of England. But they thought that the Church of England was taking on too many practices that the Catholics used. 
So they didn't like the use of the Book of Common Prayer, the use of clergy vestments during services, right. the use of the sign of the cross, of really? baptism, kneeling to receive communion. They thought all of that was too Catholic y, too popey, I've written in my book. Right. So they wanted to have a much more Protestant Church of England with less of this pomp and ceremony that I suppose they accuse. Right. Roman Catholics are quite showy. I can say this as one, <laughs> you know, by birth. It is much more showy, much more about the rituals and the, like I said, the pomp and the ceremony than Protestant services right. from what I can gather. So in the UK, there has been centuries of tension between the Protestants and the Catholics. That also gets relayed to New England, where there's also Protestant and Catholic tensions. Yeah. I've put in my notes here, calm your tits. It does not <laughs> fucking matter. It's so crazy, isn't it? That It is. You know, when you think of all the things that people could fight about. I think they maybe thought that that was dangerous. Like if people were having far too much fun with their, with their yeah. outfits and their well, ceremonies. For sure. And they thought it was very <laughs> unchristian to be so showy. Yes. There was a lot of mistrust for Europe and the Pope. Yes. And they didn't like being controlled, kind of like now in Brexit, right? They didn't want to be controlled by mainland and, you know, right. when really, who's controlling you? No one's controlling you. Calm down. So, yeah, there was all this going on. Like I said, some of the Puritans went to the Netherlands, which was much more pur Puritan. But the more fanatical ones, who didn't think that was enough, because you're still too close mm. to other Catholics, went to the colonies in New England to set up their own society. Again, under the guise of it's going to be religious freedom, but what they mean is religious freedom for themselves and no one else. Yes. The colonial leaders, the leaders, leadership in these new townships in New England were elected by the freemen. Now, you were a free man if you were a man and if you had never been a slave. That's a skewed segment of society, let's say. Yeah. And you also had to be a member of the church. So again, you're a man, you're not a slave, and you're a member of the right church. So at this time that we're talking about, New England is, is Puritan, which is Protestant, but a very, very, very extreme. strict yeah. Yeah, version of it. And in the 1640s, there was a civil war in England between the Roundheads and the Cavaliers, the Parliamentarians, who were Protestant, and the Royalists. The Royalists were not necessarily Catholic, because at the time, King Charles I, was actually Protestant, but he was what is known as High Protestant, which is the type of Protestant which is very close to Catholic right. in terms of its practices. So I suspect that the Puritans did not like him very much. No. Eventually, England becomes more Puritan itself, and the Protestant practices become less like the Catholic practices. And so actually, it means that less Puritans feel the need to migrate to uh, New England, and eventually it means that the travel between New England and England is more about trade rather than religion. And right. I suspect that's when things calm down a bit. So I wanted to talk a little bit about gender bias in the Puritan belief, because again, that plays a huge role. I'm just going to be talking about male and female here at the moment. Obviously, we know there's a whole range of genders, uh, but at the time, these were the two that were discussed and known about and talked about. And I want to add, like I said before, that men could also be witches or accused of witchcraft. Yes. But it was predominantly women. It was like 78% female. And the men that were accused tended to be linked to their female, in quotation marks. Yes. And so gender really did play a role in this. So basically, surprise, surprise, Puritans at the time were incredibly sexist. I know you're shocked. You're shocked. <laughs> <laughs> so... Their belief was that women were inherently sinful yes. and more susceptible to damnation than men. Yeah. So they believed that women and men were equal in the eyes of God, but not in the eyes of the devil. Really? Oh, now that's interesting. Right? So the devil preyed on women more than men because they were weaker. So he tried to seduce them and apparently had a higher success rate seducing women and turning them over <laughs> to the dark side. I mean, to me, it just sounds like a lot more fun, but whatever. <laughs> that is so incredibly sexist, isn't it? it Thinking is that women awful. are weaker morally, more likely to turn evil and to fall, to sin. Yeah. 
And I think like in the, this, the Pendle story with the English kind of take on that was basically that women had inherent evil. We were born sinful and yeah. we passed on that sin through childbirth. And I think yeah. that's that's the whole concept that we were just we were just yeah. weak and evil. And that will go back again to religious beliefs of Lilith and Eve and yeah. how we're just yeah. horrible, aren't we? We're just so awful. <laughs> So we've got the the Mathers again. Increase is Increase Mather is the father, and Cotton Mather is the son. Lovely names. Amazing. I'm laughing, but they are actually evil incarnate. They're evil. So they were prolific writers, and they were prominent religious Puritan leaders at the time. Right. And so I already mentioned one of Cotton's writings about how witches actually exist people weren't that concerned about the existence of witches they no. did not trouble themselves about whether witches existed or not until this movement came into play that you have to believe in witches because if you don't believe in witches you're not a christian and right. therefore you can be persecuted and prosecuted for not being a, a good christian and cotton and increase mather were very much you know in the forefront of this argument Increase Mather, the father, had published a book on witchcraft in 1684. His son, Cotton Mather, a minister of Boston's North Church, published one in 1689. Memorable providences relating to witchcrafts and possessions. What a book, right? And in this book, he talks about how the children of the Boston Mason, John Goodwin, look at him naming and shaming in his book. He's writing about actual people in his actual town. But listen, this I found this confusing, this story I had to read several times to try to make sense of what? So John Goodwin is this Boston Mason, and his family and his children were affected by witchcraft. The eldest child had been tempted by the devil and stole linen from the washerwoman, Goody Glover. <laughs> surprise, surprise, Goody Glover. Goody was like Mrs almost you get goody proctor and goody glover right. it was like i was gonna say it all sounds too cute for this terrible I story i know for such an awful story yeah. so goody glover was catholic and she was described as disagreeable of course one of my pet peeves because you know we still have this today don't we where oh yes you know a man is assertive or confident and a woman is bossy or bitchy or disagreeable yeah yeah it means you don't agree with them <laughs> yeah exactly Shame. because you know you're part of the patriarchy <laughs> and they don't like yes that. so unfortunately goody glover clearly didn't have a happy marriage because her husband actually described her as a witch and this <gasps> led her to being accused of performing witchcraft on the goodwin children so this is why i was like what hang on a minute so these little shits of kids were stealing from her yeah and so she's accused of witchcraft. So what, sorry, did she put a spell on them to rob her? Or did they rob from her because she put a spell on them? Like, what? It doesn't even make sense, does it? it doesn't. But also, interestingly, is another Catholic person accused of witchcraft. They often went hand in hand, didn't they? Yeah, exactly. So not a surprise for this poor mm-hmm. woman who was a little bit outspoken and a Catholic, yeah. whose husband clearly wasn't happy with the dynamics at home. And it all led to her downfall at this really unfortunate time in society, right? She was actually the last person to be hanged in Boston as a witch, because we're still in Boston here, not in Salem, in 1688, which is still before the Salem witch trials. Yeah. Um, But again, it's all precursors. Salem is really close to Boston. So basically, four out of the six Goodwin children began having strange fits, or what some people refer to as the disease of astonishment. (laughs) <laughs> oh gosh Actually, it sounds quite cute <laughs> it does again doesn't it the disease of astonishment which clearly also indicates that they had no clue what was happening oh well, no they've just come up with a, a title yeah. that's a bit strange so the obvious logical explanation there is that this was caused by witchcraft in hindsight and i'll talk a little bit about what people think these things were caused by now with more science and scientific knowledge yeah. and so forth Um, In hindsight, it was more likely to be hereditary or environmental or faking it because they're kids that got busted for stealing. You'd do anything, wouldn't you? You would have, those kids for sure have heard about the Hartford witch trials and so forth. So, you know, they're going to try to get out of trouble, aren't they? 
or like their own mini hysteria. You've got this thing called the folie à deux, where two people feed off each other and go a bit mad together. So maybe it was something like that, but with more than two. So now that was a little bit of the social and the religious context in New England. You have this sexism, you've got this religious yeah. extremism and this Puritan society where you really have to stay in line because otherwise you are at risk of being accused of a witch, of being a witch. This has already happened in large numbers in the very neighboring areas. So now we're coming to Salem Village, February 1692. So this is the start of the witch trial, Salem witch trial. Yeah. And Betty Paris, so Paris is one of the, the main families that I told you about. Right. Betty Paris is nine and her cousin Abigail Williams is 11. So bear in mind their ages and that they are the start of this Tiny. whole there. Yeah. They are the daughter and the niece, respectively, of Reverend Samuel Paris. So he's oh. the reverend. They both began having fits, described as beyond the power of epileptic fits or natural disease by John oh. Hale, the minister of the nearby town. So a minister, oh. not a doctor, has claimed that these are more powerful than epileptic fits and they're not natural. The girls screamed. They threw things around the room. They uttered strange sounds. They crawled under furniture. They contorted themselves into peculiar positions. I mean, it, it sounds terrifying. It does. Unnatural sort of positions of the body. Yeah. Gosh. They claim to feel pinches and pricks on their skin, even though there was no evidence of this. And then other women started exhibiting the same symptoms. The first three people then accused and arrested for allegedly afflicting Betty Paris, Abigail Williams, uh, 12-year-old Anne Putnam, and uh, Elizabeth Hubbard. So the three people accused were Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and Tituba. Right. So... This is exactly like the Pendle Witch Trials, where there was the family feud. So basically, the family feud is between the Putnams and the Porters. Right. Gosh. Putnams were Puritan farmers, and they were really wealthy, but it was like stagnant wealth. Whereas the Porters were wealthy from agriculture, entrepreneurship, commerce, trade, and their wealth was growing. Right. In 1972, the dam and sawmill run by the Porters, who were these like nouveau riche. Yeah. It flooded the Putnam's farms. They had a lawsuit. And as a result, they just had ongoing rivalry between the Putnam's yeah. and the, the Porters. And bad feeling then, terrible bad feeling between right? them. Right, and they were both very prominent members of society, both very prominent families. Right. In 1689, so only three years before the Salem Witch Trial started, Reverend Samuel Paris, who I just mentioned, was the father and the uncle of the two girls having the fits, the first two girls, he arrived in the area. 26 villagers, 11 of whom were Put Putnams, voted to give Paris a parsonage, a barn, and two acres of land. But some other villagers thought that this, these gifts for the new reverend were too generous. Right. So basically you had the Putnams and the reverend Paris and his family on one team. And yeah. the Porters, who were the nouveau riche family yes. on the other team. Eight members of the Putnam family were involved in the prosecution of approximately 50 witches. So the Putnam family were high up on the list of accusers. Mm. Thomas Putnam Jr. signed 10 legal complaints against the defendants and provided testimony against 24 accused witches. So one person on his own accused 34 people. So <laughs> they... The keeping him with the new reverend. Yeah. So and they are, bought the new reverend. They're the old family with the slightly stagnant wealth. It's not growing. It might even be on the decline. And then there's this new family, the Porters. I don't know if they're new, but they're the ones that have seemed to have this new growing wealth. Thomas Putnam made these 34 accusations. His wife, Anne Putnam, was the most prominent citizen among those who were supposedly afflicted by witchcraft, and his daughter Anne was the most prolific accuser, providing testimony against 48 accused witches. <laughs> mean. So members of the Porter family had attempted to mobilize the village against the witch trials. So the Porter family seemed to be, maybe because they were more trade rather than religious, 
yeah. motivate, religion motivated. They seem to be maybe a little bit more level headed. And so they're trying to sort of calm down these witch trials. Right, I see. But this was cut down at the knees when 19 of their allies found themselves facing witchcraft allegations. So even if you try to defend any individuals or say, look, this is a bit madness. Can we calm down a bit and use our head and be reasonable and be Christian and blah, blah, blah. Then that in itself would be enough to get you accused of witchcraft. It's political again, isn't it? Yes, for sure. Oh, gosh. It's terrible, isn't it? When you think it's terrible. It just seems like this powder keg, right? This this perfect storm brewing. You were actively encouraged yeah. to accuse because if you didn't accuse, yeah. you were like, Why are you be... not helping us defend the town against witchcraft? Maybe you're a witch. Exactly. It all sounds to be about power dynamics yeah. and money and, and trade and all the other things. And unfortunately, all those innocent people. Toxic up... masculinity and patriarchy, for sure. <laughs> I mentioned that one of the first three people accused, three women accused, was Tituba. So Tituba was the Paris family slave. So that's not very Christian of a reverend, is it, having a slave? But obviously a lot of their beliefs were marred with hypocrisy. Mm. So the plot yeah. thickens because apparently she was helping these two girls, the first two girls that were having the fits, Betty Paris, age nine, and her cousin Abigail Williams, age 11. She was helping them experimenting with fortune telling so I imagine Tichuba I don't I'm sorry oh, I don't have yeah. um, her background but she would have she was a slave in the region she would have come directly or indirectly from Africa maybe stopped off in the Caribbean she might have had some you know of those indigenous beliefs things yeah. which were frowned upon by the Puritans yeah. she was apparently yeah. showing them how to tell people's fortunes they got caught right. doing this very unchristian unpuritan yeah. thing and suddenly they start having fits. You can imagine that the, the daughter and the niece of the reverend in the area where there have been these witch trials before in yes. Connecticut and Boston and so forth will 100% have heard of witch trials. And of course, I'm sure have been spent their whole life being raised to be wary of witches and protect themselves against witches, which I'm sure is why they were curious about something like fortune telling. It's a tricky one. So did, did, did they accuse... Yeah. The slave girl then of, of which are basically causing yeah, their basically. fits. Is that so what they happened? got caught doing something naughty. Suddenly they're having fits and accusing this lady Tichuba, their slave, right. of being a witch. Because they couldn't have obviously wanted yeah. to have been accused themselves. For and... sure. So to avoid scandal. So you don't know, maybe the kids thought of it. Maybe yeah. the reverend thought it to his advantage. Who knows? Yes. Or Ila thought, well, it must have been... Tituba. Sorry, was it? What was the name? Cute Sorry, name. Was... I love the name Tituba. Tituba. But yeah, so she was one of the first oh. accused. The other two accused were Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne. Sarah Good was described as a destitute woman, and she was accused of witchcraft because of her reputation. I'm putting in quotation marks. She supposedly rejected Puritan ideals, didn't go to church and tormented children. And so what? <laughs> so Sounds perfectly reasonable. <laughs> so I don't know whether this is all out sexism, whether she was poor, kind of yeah. sounded like they were describing her as a prostitute potentially, but she was clearly one of the down and outs in the society at the time. And so an easy target, especially to be accused by, you know, one of the prominent Again. families and the minister or the reverend. Sarah Osborne was another woman in the area just it's sickening listen to this right so she she was a widow and so she was left her, her husband's estate she remarried an indentured servant so I've heard this term so many times and I never fully understood it so I took the opportunity to research so not a servant with dentures number one indentured mm -hmm. servitude is a form of labor in which a person is contracted to work without a salary for a specific number of years so basically you're a slave probably with a bit more rights because you're probably white. Yeah. You're working for a certain amount of time for a contract called an indenture. It might be voluntary or compensation or debt repayment. There might be, you know, a reason, a specific reason why you've gone into servitude for this family or this person. Or it could be in, imposed as a judicial punishment. So like community service. Really? So basically you're working for free for X amount of years to either pay off a debt or to pay off a debt to society. 
Right. So again, they would have been considered very low on the, you know, the total pole of society, right? So the fact that this woman, who wasn't an indentured servant, married one, was frowned upon. And surprise, surprise, her first husband, who, who died and left her a widow, was related to the Putnams. Right. So if you think why anyone even cared about this woman, it's because she was a Putnam, which, remember, was the family that teamed up with the Reverend. Yeah. The relative of the Putnams, who she was married to, had left her quite a nice, tidy sum and some property when he died. So okay. when she remarried, that property, that estate, basically goes to this indentured servant who they would have looked down on. So really, they want this back, don't they? They wanted it back or kept in the, you know, in their circles. Yeah. They would have seen it as a betrayal that she married someone else that yeah. they didn't approve of and that their family wealth was being yeah. split up and going to someone they didn't approve of. So basically, Sarah Osborne and her new husband were outcasts of society already. So were so was Sarah Good. So they were prejudiced against them already. And they were seen as not godly, not Christian, not Puritan enough. Yeah. And now we've got a society that's scared as well, because these little girls are having fits and they already are so scared of these witches that are popping up everywhere. Yeah. Or if they're not scared of the witches, they're scared of the people that believe in witches turning on them for not believing in witches. So it's really, oh, dear. I mean, it must have been just terrifying living at this time. Yeah. And just... Especially if you were in the groups that were on the edges of society again, yeah. we're Catholics, slaves, widows, the yeah. poor. People, and they people. were for sure the first to get accused, but this Salem witch trial was so, the accusations were so prolific that in the end, no one was spared. And really? the fact that you were in a Gosh. prominent family or that you went to church every day or whatever, uh, didn't protect you it anymore. It just got out of hand yeah. completely. Which, surprise, surprise, is also when things started to calm down, because mm. we can't have prominent people being affected, can we? Of course not. 1st of March, 1692, these three ladies, Tituba the slave that supposedly taught the girls how to fortune tell, Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne were the ones that were first accused and arrested and they were interrogated, which must have been severely unpleasant, and sent to jail. In March, a whole bunch of other people were accused. We've got Martha Corey because she was skeptical of the kids' fits. I mean... (laughs) and Rebecca Nurse in Salem Village. This freaked people out because both of these ladies were actually full-up members of their churches. So now being religious, like I said, was no longer protection against being accused of witchcraft. Unless you are a man, though. Obviously a lot more protection if you are a godly yeah. man, in quotation marks. Yeah. Dorothy Good, who was a child and was the daughter of Sarah Good, she was poor. She was questioned at this point. And she apparently implicated her mother Sarah Good, who's in jail, one of the first three to be accused. But again, she was four. Like, what is she going to have to say that would implicate her mother? At four, you're you're easily led. Yeah. Then Sarah Cloyce, who was Rebecca Nurse's sister. Elizabeth Proctor was arrested in April. They were brought before John Hathorne. So John Hathorne is one of the main evil men in this story. And Jonathan Corwin, they were the local magistrates. And then because Elizabeth Proctor's husband objected to all this, Mm. what a man, right? (laughs) Um, He also got arrested and accused because he was defending his wife. Within a week, Giles Corey, who was Martha's husband and a covenanted church member in Salem town, Abigail Hobbs, Bridget Bishop, Mary Warren, who was a servant in the Proctor household and sometimes accuser, and Deliverance Hobbs, the stepmother of Abigail Hobbs were all arrested and examined. And I'm going to tell you more about what being examined means. Oh, no. Three of them, Abigail Hobbs, Mary Warren, Deliverance Hobbs, they all confessed and began naming additional people as accomplices. Right. It is thought that several of the women confessed in order to spare their own lives, that they were told, if you just confess, we won't execute you. Gosh. And also that accusing others would mean that you would be tried leniently. You always wonder why they counter-accuse, don't you? But that must be it. It's just terrible, though, isn't it? Awful. Who knows how you would act if you were in this situation where your life is literally Mm. in the balance. I think we'd all like to think that we wouldn't start accusing other people just for the sake of it. But you never know. And 
you can certainly see how it would have been easy for these powerful people to manipulate these women that were scared and have lived in fear. Yeah. Because of this social context that we discussed. And so it went on. In May, accusations continue to pour in. Sarah Osborne, one of the first three women that we talked about, died in jail on May 10th, 1962. I wish I could list all the people that were accused and whether they were convicted or what happened to them, but the list is very long. Like I said, it was more than 200 people. So I feel like I can't do their pain and fear and suffering justice, but there were so many just by the end of May. So this started the first people being accused on the 1st of March. By the end of May, the total number of people in custody was 62. Good gracious. Wow. Which, you know, these are not large towns. I didn't get the population no. sizes. They're still very small villages, basically. So 62 is that's everyone they... knows someone who's in there, basically. Oh, rather, if you put it another way, everyone knows someone who's a witch then. I mean, yeah. they're talking about so many witches. That it's so common then. They're Sure, and they can't believe that. Can you imagine how it must have torn apart society? Because you've got the people yeah. being accused and then you've got the accusers and they're all in the yeah. same small towns. And oh, it's just, I just cannot even imagine how no. terrifying it must have been living in this time. Then we have the Court of Oyer and Terminer convened in Salem Town on June 2nd. So, you know, you had a lot of these like traveling courts. This is how I imagine it. They'd come into town, wouldn't they? Periodically yeah, and, and move around. And try all the cases that had sort of built yes. up. Which yes. is just terrible, because I imagine people just had to wait for the next time the judge came to town or whatever, the magistrate. We've got the court coming to town, to Salem Town, on June 2nd, 1692, with William Stoughton as chief magistrate, Thomas Newton as the Crown's attorney prosecuting the cases, and Stephen Sewell as clerk. Clark? Clark? I'd say Clark, but I'm I'm Yorkshire, yeah. so I don't, I don't know. <laughs> One of those. Yeah. Total asshole in any case. That yeah. We can definitely agree on. Bridget Bishop's case was the first brought to the grand jury. And right. she was accused of not living a Puritan life. Wearing black clothes and odd costumes. So, I mean, we would have been fucked, wouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> if that was enough. And listen how awful this is. They made a big deal of her coat because it had been torn. So apparently having a torn coat was a sign of an immoral lifestyle, which to me just comes across completely classist. I don't know whether she was poor. They clearly already have prejudices against her in these incredible, difficult ways of life to have a rip in your coat just seems like it must be the norm, right? Is it like po- be- sort of blaming the poor for being poor? There was a lot of that sort of concept yeah, that it was sure. your fault. So if she uh, if she was poor enough to have a rip coat, that she'd done something to get to that. Yeah. And the yeah. fact that they're saying that the, a, the ripped coat is a sign of an immoral lifestyle, again, mm-hmm. implies to me that they are being like dirty old men and they're implying yeah. that, you know, it's got ripped in some kind of sexual activity Uh, or something or other I don't know that that's how I'm interpreting it a little bit (sighs) again not helped by the fact that she didn't go to church she went to trial and was convicted on the same day and she was executed by hanging on June 10th so like a week later as a witch as a witch so I mean these things are happening it's happening fast it's picked up momentum really fast when you think the girls started having these fits in February and the first of March I was the first accused um, yeah. people accused of witchcraft. And 2nd of June is the first trial. And 10th of June is the first execution. Good gracious. This is within a few months, the whole <laughs> of this society is being turned upside down with these accusations and these um, executions. So then after this one trial, bear in mind that they've already got 62 people in custody, they decided oh, wow. to have a 20 day break which left all of these other people accused in jail to rot, literally. Yeah. And the reason why they took this break is because they wanted to seek advice from the sort of leaders of New England. They could tell that if they carried on at this rate, basically how little evidence, in quotation marks, you needed to prove that someone, again, in quotation marks, was a witch. Everything's in quotation marks here because it's all bullshit. If they carried on at this rate that they were going to be executing a huge amount of people because the accusations are still coming in. They've got these 61 other people still in jail at this one point. It's increasing by the day. So I suppose they just wanted to check with their higher ups to make sure they were doing 
the right thing, again in quotation marks. They got a letter back from Cotton Mather. Remember that guy? Cotton and Increase? Yeah, the book fella. Oh, I've got here. I want to see what evil looks like. Let me just open it up. Have you have got a picture of him? Oh, just they make my skin crawl. I will post these pictures on our socials. So this is Cotton. Oh, gosh. The wig thing is... Oh, gosh. I know. It's just odd, isn't it? It's just so odd. It would look intimidating, wouldn't it? Can you imagine if you didn't oh, yeah. have... You know, you were in front of the cart, you had a ripped coat like that other poor lady, and then there's people in the, the cart with this level of regalia. You would have thought it was a completely different world to yours, wouldn't you? Yeah. So um, the magistrate and the Crown's attorney sought advice on whether they were they had handled this case correctly, whether they should carry on as they have been doing, because yeah. I think they had this foresight that it was at this rate going to be a huge amount of people accused, a huge amount of people convicted, passing the buck a bit, aren't they? But yeah, so Cotton Mather yeah. comes back and doesn't say, like, proceed with caution or, you know, make sure you use logic and reason. He says, crack on, you're doing a great job. You know, get all those witches, basically. And said that you could convict witches with even less evidence if they wanted to. Less evidence than a torn coat and not going to church? Yep. Crikey. He could have stopped the madness or tapered it off a little bit. Instead, he increased it and was very happy to do so. So you have, as a result, more people accused more people arrested more people examined which again I'll, I'll I will go into more detail mm-hmm. about what an examination involved by the former local magistrates John Hathorne um Jonathan C- Cortwin and Bartholomew Gedney who had become mm-hmm. judges of the court of Oyer and Terminer so they've gone from magistrates evil magistrates to evil judges so you know <laughs> considering they were accusing people and convicting people in the past yeah they are now judges, which seems like you shouldn't be allowed to be a judge on a case if you are not unbiased about it. Right. But this didn't apply then, I guess. So if you want to see another picture of evil. Gosh. John Hathorne, yep, came back from being sort of a magistrate accusing people of it and so forth to being the judge. In July, we have a load more trials and convictions. Five women were hanged, including one of the originals, Sarah Goods. She was one of the original three. Right, yeah. In August, the Proctors, Elizabeth Proctor and her husband, who was defending her, were convicted, amongst others. Elizabeth was given a stay of execution because she was pregnant, so she was only executed later. Um, Her husband was executed, along with one of the religious um, people that were accused, Martha Corey. She was one of the ones that was very churchy, but thought all of this was basically batshit, got accused. So she was also executed. And then we have a reverend. Reverend Burroughs was also accused and executed. And his final words were the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, blah, blah, blah. The fact that these were his final words was like a big fuck you to the people who were executing him. Because one of the theories was that yes. witches couldn't say the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, I've heard that, yeah. Not that they didn't know it, which is one thing. And maybe they, yeah. didn't, you know, maybe these people accused didn't always know the full prayer because they weren't very churchy and so they didn't say it regularly. Well, that's enough. another thing, isn't it? Again, poverty. If you didn't know, you couldn't read, you, you know, yeah, you weren't entitled exactly. to the learning. So, you know, that's clearly where it stemmed from. Yeah. But they believed that a witch physically couldn't say it so even if they could read and put the words in front of them that they could physically couldn't utter them so I think that he was just being giving them a big fuck you big middle finger by saying the Lord's Prayer the people watching because of course at these executions there were audiences as was normal Mm -hmm. for the time they had tears in their eyes the accuser said that the devil was actually reciting the words through the reverend it's like come on you always have an excuse don't you like clutching at straws now aren't they right so oh witches can't say it but if they do say it it's because the devil's speaking through them like come oh, on what well, it's a crap when the reverend was hanged and dead our dear friend cotton mather who was actually there for this one said that it was not unusual for the devil to trick people like this and that the reverend wasn't actually a reverend at all he was actually accused by the way because he was helping the defense team of those originally accused of witchcraft 
So in my mind, he sounds like what a real Christian should be like. Right. But like I said, if you even defended, if you said a word in defense, let alone formally try to defend. Right. Then you were at risk of being accused and executed. Oh, the poor man. I know. He might have been actually one of the few Christians who actually practiced yeah. what, what he preached. You know, not to judge, not to throw stones. Yeah. And then they treated his body terribly. The the executors, the people involved in this, they cut down the reverend and brought him to his grave or his hole. They took his clothes off and they just threw him in a grave with other people, which just is sickening, isn't it? It makes you feel physically sick. Yeah, so there's no, no respect at all for the life or the death of someone. So now we're in September. So really it's like, what less than six months have passed yeah six months ish and this madness has taken hold of their villages the grand jury accused 18 more people in september giles Corey, who was the husband of one of the accused who was also accused was killed through torture because these people were definitely tortured so the form of torture in which he passed was um, he was subjected to being pressed beneath an increasingly heavy load of stones. So they crushed him to death, basically, in an attempt to make him enter a plea. Four pleaded guilty. The four actually said, yes, I'm guilty of witchcraft. When they've got the stones on them. Again, they're being tortured. Yeah. They might think that pleading guilty will spare them their life, at least. Yeah. And 11 others were tried and found guilty. Dorcas Hoare was given a temporary reprieve with the support of several ministers to make confession of being a witch. Mary Bradbury, who was age 77, which at that time was ancient, managed to escape with the help of family and friends. And then trials basically continued on and on. So in January 1693, so now we're in the following year, many were actually not found guilty, but three were found guilty. But things are slowing down a lot and pardons are starting to be issued. Five more people were tried in January and all were found not guilty, but then they weren't released until they paid their jail fees. That's the crazy. You had to pay for rent. You're found innocent, but you still have to pay your jail fees. One of them died in jail in March of 1693. So found innocent, couldn't pay the jail fees and so died in jail. Yeah, because they wouldn't let you out if you hadn't paid. And I just absolutely ridiculous. Out. I just can't, you just can't comprehend it, can you? Because how no. can you be in jail and earn money to pay for your jail rent when you're in jail? It's like a circular argument. Exactly. And the longer you stay in it, the exactly. higher your debt gets because the more time they're going to charge you rent for being in jail. Wow. And all of this when you weren't supposed to be in jail at all because you were wow. found innocent. It's, I mean, it's, the mind boggles. And thankfully, in where we live, at least society has moved on so far from this but it's just I don't know it's just sickening it is so things are slowing down and eventually they come to an end and you don't have this mass hysteria of people being accused of witchcraft I suppose they felt they they managed to like root out all the witches so I've got a subheading here witch cake and what happens when you are mates with the main accusers according to Paris who is the reverend, whose daughter and niece were the ones that started all this craziness. Yeah. In March 1692, which was the first month of people being accused, a church member and close neighbor of Reverend Paris, Mary Sibley, directed John Indian, a man enslaved by Paris. So he had more than one slave, not just Tituba, right. but he also had John Indian, um, right. which I imagine is a derogatory name given to him. Paris's neighbor, Mary Sibley, asks his other slave, John Indian, to make a witch cake. This could have been to ward off evil or to discover witches. It was made from rye meal and urine from the afflicted girls and was fed to a dog. Oh, dog. Oh my gosh. So she was, it seems like, trying to protect the girls and maybe fighting fire with fire. If they were afflicted by witchcraft, maybe she thought, well, then we have to use this sort of witchcraft to save them. Mm. but clearly Reverend Paris is not going to view it like that and he's going to see it as this friend and neighbor actually partaking in witchcraft well yeah so in the church records Paris describes speaking to Mary Sibley privately in March of 1692 about her grand error and accepted her sorrowful confession 
Right, okay. His friend and neighbour just has to say sorry for being a bit witchy, and she's fine. Well, there you go, you see. I'm not saying that Mary Sibley should have been executed for asking for... No, not at all. Not at all. It's just not fair, is it? No, it's terrible. So some of the other evidence that people found, again, in quotation mark, against these witches, in quotation mark, the discovery of puppets, which are, you know, little, you know, either stick figures or little dolls. Right. But they could literally be child dolls in some cases. Some of the people accused were children. Some of the people accusing were children. And there's loads of other reasons why people made little figurines, you know? Books on palmistry or horoscopes or anything that was deemed unchristian or a bit witchy woo-woo. Pots of ointment. So basically, if you had anything medicinal. Exactly. If you try to get rid of your headache, you're a witch. (laughs) Yeah. Any kind of salve, any kind of moisturizer, anything, anything, any cooking thing, you know, any blend of herbs for cooking. So if you wanted to be so witchy as to not eat bland food, shame on you. And then here, this is what, you know, I mentioned a few times being examined. So being examined is awful. It meant being stripped naked and basically they were looking for what they called witch's teats or witch's marks. So it could be a mole or a blemish or, um, you know, birthmark somewhere on the body that was insensitive to touch. Discovery of such insensitive areas was considered de facto evidence of witchcraft. So if you had a mole. Yeah, which we all do. That was literally 100% proof that you're a witch. So it means being stripped naked by these men that we saw the pictures of, being body shamed. In an audience. With an audience, for sure. It might be in the actual courtroom. Which one of us doesn't have some kind of mole or birthmark or weird thing on our body, you know? We're talking about mostly women again, aren't we? So we're talking about mostly a, a female being stripped naked with an audience of judges and magistrates and and which are mostly male so it's a real peculiar dynamic that isn't it it's just it's horrifying I mean yeah you know the fact that it is now illegal in most countries to have this if you had to be examined for any reason it would not be with an audience it would be by people of the same gender as you and because again at this point you're still technically innocent aren't you (laughs) so well yeah Decades after the trials, people are still tainted by it and trying to clear their names because obviously if you were friends or family member of any of these people yeah. accused and executed of witchcraft, you were definitely prejudiced against. And over the years, some people were cleared. But finally, in November 2001, Good gracious. legislature was passed to exonerate the convicted and naming each of them as innocent. That's like 300 years later. So, which is is good, and but it doesn't help those people at the time, does it? No, I mean, no. it's, and and there's movements to make this be the case uh, with the Scottish witch trials as well. Currently, the, uh, hopefully that will go through shortly as well. But it's great that they can say yes, they were innocent, you know, in a rational, modern way. But at the time, I know. The, the hope is, I think, that it means that it's even less likely to happen again. Hopefully. Rebecca Nurse's descendants erected an obelisk-shaped granite memorial in her memory in 1885 on the grounds of their estates, what's now Danvers. The 300th anniversary of the trials was marked in 1992 in Salem and Danvers by a variety of events. A memorial park was dedicated in Salem which included stone slab benches inserted in the stone walls of the park for each of those executed executed in 1692. I would love to go visit that. Speakers at the ceremony in 1992 included playwright Arthur Miller, who wrote the amazing play The Crucible. I really recommend it. It's basically a play using these events. Right. I'm just going to finish on some medical theories about the afflictions. Yeah. What actually happened to, in particular, these two girls that had the fits and then some other women in the town started also suffering. Yeah. It could have been any of the following. It could have been some sort of psychological hysteria. It could have been something called convulsive egotism, a kind of food poisoning from eating rye bread 
made from grain infected by a specific fungus. So one oh. that LSD is derived from. Ah. If you think, we've already said that rye bread is used in baking in yes. the time in the witch's cake, but I'm sure that it was used in other things. You know, it, it could be some sort of environmental factor right. that has caused them to genuinely, two people of the same household could yes. very easily be afflicted by the same illness or the same environmental factor. That to me seems much more logical than... It does, doesn't it? You know, it could be birdborne encephalitis, which is swelling of the brain. Or it could be that they were just fucking faking it because they got busted doing something that they knew because they were related to this reverend was right. seriously wrong. And then, you know, well, I say seriously wrong, seriously wrong according to the reverend and that they wanted to stay out of trouble. And then that whole thing was fueled by this family feud, by jealousy, yeah. by classism, by sexism, by all of those things, by spite and by fear again. Yeah. On a cute note, I put here, end on a cute note. Yeah, it was. There used to be a minor league baseball team called the Salem Witches. Oh, For a lot of people, that to me indicates that they've reclaimed the name and being yes. known for witchcraft in Salem or, you know, it's not, an, yeah. it's not a slur anymore, is it, being a Salem witch? No, and in fact, isn't there like a renaissance of modern witchcraft in Salem? So lots of practicing witches that live and work. and Yeah, I mean, I know they have like a head witch and I, I don't remember the town very much at all. Obviously, I was four when I went and I just remember the jacket incident. But I imagine it to be like how you said Pendle was and yes. how um, like Glastonbury, I went to Glastonbury last week, how I think that mm-hmm. is it does attract people that are spiritual in that way or of those beliefs. And then with that comes a lot of obviously tourism and some tacky tourism stuff. Some alongside, yeah. Yeah, but there's a reason that these tourists are attracted to that area and it's because they are genuinely spiritual or have this background or they do seem to, it has this atmosphere and this vibe because it does attract all of these witches and pagans and whatever. So yeah, I'd love to go back now as an adult. Yeah, it's somewhere I'd love to go as well. Yeah, and mm-hmm. it's like like you were saying about Pendle. It's 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 reclaiming, it's honouring those that did unfortunately lose their lives, isn't it? And it's sort of taking back that place as a pilgrimage, really, to which is it does warm my heart that history is favouring the witches in quotation marks, the people yes. that were accused, and not the accusers. And hopefully that means that, you know, any kind of religious persecution in this way, um, hopefully it won't happen again. Sadly, it does happen in other places still. And It does. But each time we talk about it and each time we sort of, like you were saying, get rid of the convictions, that sort of puts it down as this was wrong. And so it, it does colour anything that comes after, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And if more people are aware of how horrible it can be when you start letting your society go down that route, hopefully there'll be more people against it. That was the Salem Witch Trials. If anyone's been to Salem and anyone has any Salem stories, please do post on our social medias or or send us a message. Um, Hello at weknewthemoon.co.uk. We would love to hear some Salem stories, wouldn't we, Michelle? I would, yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah, if you've yeah. been, is it worth it? Is it too touristy? Can you avoid some of the touristy? I mean, I love some of the touristy stuff. I'm not going to lie, you know. No. I'll buy a fridge magnet, but I also don't want the the essence of a place to be completely ruined by, <laughs> but, which is totally hypocritical to go to a tour to a tourist spot and as a tourist and complain if it's too touristy or not touristy enough. It's very typical of me but whatever um but yeah tell us your Salem stories if where should we go in Salem where was your favorite shop or your favorite oh, yes yeah you know I've heard it, about um a Bessem shop that sells um the, the broomsticks that's it for me and the Salem Witch Trials and I hope you can join us next time where Michelle will be talking to us about cunning folk which was also a byproduct of our last episodes together yeah looking forward to that day See you next week then. Bye. Bye. 
If you want lots more fun, moon info, and all things spiritual, plus our merch shop, please visit our website, weenythemoon.co.uk. And if you want even more, head over to our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash we knew the moon and check out some of our bonus content we're also on facebook and instagram at we.new.the.moon and we're also on twitter at we knew the moon one see you next time